what we had with Trump was a kind of plutocratic populism, a faux populism. But it's not enough uh, simply for, for those of us, uh, say, to the left of center, to say how terrible Trump was and to point out the hypocrisy of massive ta tax cuts for the wealthy and for corporations uh, carried out by a supposed populist. It's not enough. It's also important for us to ask the question, what was it that he was appealing to that, that we missed, that mainstream Democrats and mainstream Republicans missed about the mounting anger and frustration. And this goes to what you were saying a moment ago about credentialism, because part of when along with the widening inequalities brought about by neoliberal globalization, were changing attitudes towards success. Those who landed on top during the past four decades came to believe that their success was their own doing the measure of their merit, and that they therefore deserved the full measure of the bounty the market bestowed upon them, and by implication, that those who struggled must deserve their fate as well. This is the meritocratic hubris, the kind of credentialist prejudice that made many working people feel that elites were looking down on them. And just as you point out, there are people who've been educated at elite institutions who are trying to articulate that same message, the one put forward by Trump. But until, until, we, <clears throat> until we have a kind of more genuine populism that addresses the structure of the economy and the dignity of work, I think that the, that the suspicion of many working people against credentialed meritocratic elites and professionals and experts will persist. There's also the fact that along with neoliberal globalization and a kind of credentialist meritocracy came a, a technocratic view of politics, the idea that we're beyond ideology now, that it's for experts to determine the shape of the economy, the deregulation of finance, the, the trade agreements that outsource jobs to low wage countries, these were all promoted in the name of expertise, the expertise of economists. And I think that the anger and resentment against those arrangements and against the widening inequalities they produced led to a deep suspicion of experts and expertise. And we saw, we saw the bitter fruits of that during the pandemic when the, the suspicion of expertise extended beyond the economists who had brought us this uh, into this fix to public health figures and Dr. Fauci and, and uh, those public health experts who were trying mm -hmm. to give advice on how to deal with the pandemic. Yeah, I would say that there's also a uh, the, the kind of secondary effects of that are that people then feel empowered by being their own experts and doing their own research. It's like this democratization of credentialism through online discourse where I've always said that, you know, the conspiracy theories of like anti-vax stuff are a way for people to feel empowered over their health care and over their kind of uh, place in society that values that kind of cr credentialism or seems to do so. Um, in terms of where they are at in the economic ladder. And it, it, it feeds uh, a like this insatiable kind of uh, desire to not feel so alienated from our right. politics and our society. And, and it leads people down roads of further alienation as they get into these kind of subcategories uh, through, you know, again, conspiracy theory online. Yes. And and I think we, we should not underestimate the extent to which this alienation has partly to do with uh, higher education and the role that universities have come to play. Mm -hmm. Not only did they produce the experts who gave us 
with great confidence the version of market-driven, finance-driven uh, globalization that led to the widening inequalities. But as, as uh, working people faced stagnant wages in real terms for four decades in the outsourcing of jobs, the mainstream politicians, center right and center left, offered the following solution. You remember what they said, if you want to compete and win in the global economy, go to university, get a college degree. Mm. What you earn will depend on what you learn. You can make it if you try. This is what I call the, the rhetoric of rising. But there was an insult implicit in that rhetoric. The insult was this. If you're struggling in the new economy and you don't have a college degree, your failure must be your fault. That's the implication. We told you to better yourself, to go to college so that you too could compete in the economy that we designed. But the problem is most, most people don't have a four-year college degree. Most Americans don't. Um, nearly uh, over 60% do not. So it was folly to create an economy that set as a necessary condition for dignified work and a decent life, a college degree that most people don't have. So this is one of the ways in which uh, uh, those mainstream politicians created the, the resentment and also the backlash, not only against elites, but against universities who have now become a target for many on, on the right. For um, uh, And I think it, it's because of the role universities and the promise that a college education would be your way of contending with the inequality we created that has led to a lot of that anger. Yeah. And then that, that same party kind of, uh, and, and frankly, the Democrats are not good on this either, ha have, yeah. have not created any kind of bridge to make education, higher education, more accessible to people. I mean, right now, the student loan cancellation is tied up in court, but should have canceled all of it. I mean, and then that's, I guess, on the back end. But still, you look at some of what the cost of what paying for college would be, and it's peanuts compared to what the federal government pays for in terms of a free college program on military increases on a yearly basis. So that's a bit of an aside. But I, I you... but could I pick up on, on sure, that aside, sure. which is important, Emma, which yeah. is we also have to pay attention to the full range of educational opportunities that we as a country are supporting. An economist at Brookings uh, compared the amount we spend helping people go to uh, four-year colleges with the amount we spend on supporting community colleges and technical and vocational training centers. And she found that we spend, this was some, a few years ago, $164 billion helping students go to college. That's a good thing. But only $1.1 billion on community colleges and vocational and technical training. This is a vast disproportion, which really reflects the neglect of the educational uh, institutions where most, uh, most of our fellow citizens prepare themselves for the world of work and for that matter of citizenship. So this too reflects, this neglect reflects a kind of credentialist prejudice that is deeply at odds with the dignity of work, which I think should be should be the focus of progressive politics, focus less on arming people for meritocratic competition and focus more on the dignity of work, making life better for people who contribute through the work they do and the communities they serve to the common good, whether or not they have a four year degree. Yes. Um, and again, the, the, just to add, the purchasing power of a four year degree is also going down as well. Um, yeah. and, and so it's it, it's a bunch of compounding factors.